Um, so you've all met Emer Pike, who is the central person in this MCH, in this program, and who will be the person who will be looking after you uh, over the next one year for those of you in full time and uh, two years for those of you doing part time. Um, so first of all, you're, very, you're all very welcome to the MCH program. It's very strange to, to talk to you all like this because normally this is um, in RCSI and it's uh, normally a sort of fairly sunny kind of a, an afternoon and it's all very nice. Stephen's Green is full of people and there's lots going on and the coffee shops and restaurants and bars are all open and <clears throat> excuse me, and we all meet up and uh, we have a little chat and you all get to see each other and meet each other and so on. But it's it's different, and um, I, I suppose that that's what what we're, we're we all know about, and that a lot of the things that we're telling about, some of it is set up and will be delivered like this, but some of it is subject to change. And I guess those three words, subject to change, are are hanging over nearly everything that we're planning uh, all, all the time. But 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 the reality of it is that we will get through this MCH. We'll get you through it. Uh, you'll get through it, and we hope you get a lot of information from it, and we hope you get professionally from it what you want to get. Um, so as I say, you're all very welcome and you're from different uh, specialties and you're in different areas and from different uh, uh, schemes and so on. And um, that's the way it is every year. And we've put in, or we've put over 200 um, surgical trainees through the MCH since it started in 2009. So as you can imagine, the ones that are started in 2009, they're, they're all consultants and they're all in, in practice and that. And um, I'm sure you can remember back to where you were in 2009 and those people were, were starting off where you are now. So so time moves on and you, you do these things and you get something from it and it brings you on to the next level of your career. And that that's that's what the purpose of the MCH was, because at that time it, it, there wasn't really any structure or any organization to to an MCH. And it was at that time, as it is still is to some extent, a prerequisite to to getting onto a heart specialist training program or continuous surgical training or, or whatever the format it happens to be. Um, we, we understand that that's the, the motivation behind many of you doing uh, an MCH or doing a master's in that you need the points to get on your career. And so that, that's what's driving you to come here. And, and our uh, obligation or our goal is to put the content into an MCH uh, that will be relevant for you in that it was um, some of the pure MCH module research, uh, the MCH that were done purely by research, they were sometimes in very, very narrow areas and uh, people would come along and get very good at that area of research and then they tick the box, they'd get the MCH and they'd move on. And that wouldn't, wouldn't really have any uh, ongoing benefit for them uh, or in fact for the area of research and that they would just do it. It was almost like a test of their commitment to see how much do you want to do this surgical training program. And, so the drive was to move it away from that. And so to have some of it, that there are modules that, that give you professional uh, preparation. And by that, I mean, like clearly when you, you go along and join your, your surgical training programs, you're gonna be taught all the things about, you know, how to make incisions and where to do it and how to dissect and how to do the operations and who to do them on and how to look after the masters and so on. And they're all the key parts of your clinical preparation to be doing the jobs that you will be doing. Um, there are other areas that as you will find that when you are in practice as a consultant or even as a senior uh, uh, or that there are other areas that come into play. And they are things that we've tried to cover in these modules. And they range from, obviously from the research methodology module. And um, research, no matter what way you slice it up, and most people doing surgery aren't thinking of doing uh, PhDs and so on. Although over the years we have had some who have progressed on to do MDs and we had one who progressed on to do a PhD because they became interested in that topic. But most people who are doing surgery are doing surgery because they want to do surgery. Um, and what research is that essential Sorry, John, you've gone on mute there. John, you, you've muted. Just now. Yeah, oh. go back a little bit there. Yeah. yeah. So am I on mute? No, you're fine now. Yeah, fine. Could you hear me before? Yeah, we could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um so so the research part of it is really important. First of all, so that when somebody suggests to you a new technique for doing something, or you go to a meeting, that you have this ability to to look at evidence as it's presented to you and to decide if it's bogus or if it's realistic or if it's good or if it's properly done research. And for some of you, 
it'll give you that opportunity and that enthusiasm to go ahead and do a research project, which of course is part of the requirements for you to progress in your training. But it's ultimately as, as consultants that that's what we're preparing you for, that even though you mightn't be doing PhDs or MDs, you will have an understanding of how to do a research project and be interested in it and encourage people to do it. So the research methodology module is, is really a central module for the whole thing. The other modules are the, the ethics module, and this is a, a really important one too, because each time during your practice as a junior doctor, as a senior trainee, as a consultant, you will come across these situations where there are kind of ethical dilemmas and they're, they're not really huge lofty ethical dilemmas. They're just a difficulty in knowing what should you do at, at a certain time with a certain patient who's got a relative who wants this and the patient wants that and so on and so forth. And it's a particularly good module and students really like it, even though on the surface of it, uh, it, it looks like one that may not be as exciting as, as you might think. But in fact, it, it's run by David Smith and he makes it a really exciting module and really interesting. And the, it becomes these real lively debates about the ethics and rights and wrongs of, of a given doctor's behavior in a certain circumstance. So it's quite a good module. The leadership and management module, again, something that prepares you very much for the role that you will have as a consultant, because inevitably, whether you decide, oh, I'm going to be a clinical director or not, you will have a role in terms of liaising with management. And that that is as a patient advocate. So it's not like you need to be going off and doing a, you know, looking at the books and balancing the books and all the rest of it. But you will need to understand the way a hospital runs and the issues that are relevant if you are to be a, a capable and articulate patient advocate in, in your hospital or your health service or wherever it is. Um, then there is uh, medicine, uh, surgery in the developing world. Now that is because some of you and near, lots of my colleagues and lots of, of some of you uh, have gone and spent time in the developing world working there, looking after patients, either for short term or long term. And it is good for you to have an understanding that, you know, medicine and surgery as it's delivered is not always the same as it is in St. James's Hospital and St. Vincent's and the Matter and Beaumont and Cork and Waterford and Galway. It's, it's, it's different and it can be delivered in a different way. And it just gives you an insight into the sort of things that you can do if you want to go abroad, work in uh, different uh, agencies, do different things. And so the different levels that you can function at. So, and it's a little bit about, about the things that you can do. And you will meet some people who've done those things and they will tell you about it again, not something that is full of like learning objectives and learning outcomes and aims and goals, but just it's it's educational for you to understand that these things can be done by you and how they can be done and what kind of an experience you can expect. Then to some extent at the other end of the spectrum from that is the medical innovation, uh, the medical device design and innovation module, which is um, when you, you realize that the, people who are in the position you're in, if you see something like, you know, the way you hold a retractor or the way something is done and you see something that could be done better, no one else is going to see that. You're the ones who see it. And very often um, people have ideas, but they're by the time they've, you know, they've had the idea, then they're they've finished their long list and then they just change and they go home and then they study for their exam and then they prepare for their next day and so on. And they never really think of developing an idea. And it's just to give you confidence and insight and understanding of how you can take an idea and develop it and turn it into something that might be helpful. And, you you know, it, it's, it's all about innovation and it's all about you trying new ideas. Lots of these ideas don't work. Lots of them, I've, I've had a few uh, patents over the years where I've thought they've been absolutely, they, I mean, they were brilliant ideas. They were absolutely brilliant ideas, but it just didn't, uh, uh, no one else seemed to think they were such good ideas. Um, so you know, there are lots of things that you try that they don't work, but it's better for you to understand that you can do these things and you can try them and you should do them. And that's what that module is, is all about. Um, so I think they're all the modules that that I've I've touched on. Um, I hate to leave on it. Uh, yeah. So each one of those will help you in your professional um, career. And obviously, some of the areas of some of them you'll hear about them. You'll never touch them again. Um, but it's to give you that information. The other. Uh, the, the thing about the modules is they were obviously all delivered uh, in or CSI in the past. Now we are changing all of these things so that they are nearly all online. The one that isn't online 
is the innovation module. And that is because uh, the format of it was people getting together in groups and working in groups, having an idea and then discussing how they could develop it and how they could make a certain device better. And everybody's literally chipping in saying, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And it's very much brainstorming in a, in a sort of a group sitting beside each other, passing this suggested device around. Um, so at the moment, that's the one that you may get face to face. And it is actually nice for you to get face to face because in fact, this year there's 13 of you doing the full time and I think uh, 19 uh, first year part time. 20. Um, 20. So uh, it is nice for you to meet each other, but it may not be possible. The other modules are being delivered online, which is good news in terms of you if you are not close to RCSI and so on. <clears throat> However, I, the ideal obviously would that be it would be available for you to do online on demand. But this year at the moment, we are not able to do that on demand. So for the schedule, that we have made out for when you need to do, for example, your research methodology module. It is going to take place on those days. So you have to be free on those days to attend it online. Um, in due course, some of these modules may become online and on demand, which obviously would would uh, would introduce a whole lot more flexibility, but it's not like that this year. So the schedules that you're given uh, are the days that you have to be available. Now we will record them and if you every year there's situations with people that they miss one part of a day or miss one part of a module and if it is possible if it's pre-recorded we may be able to deliver you that you can then do that part of that module subsequently uh, at a time that you you are able to do it uh, but at the moment we can't have it that you just decide i will do all of that research methodology module at my own time um and um that, that's the thing. And again, each year we, we explain to people about being available for modules. And we do understand that you're all in busy jobs. You're many of you are on call. You're on rotas with three or four other uh, people in the same situation as you. Uh, they need leave. People are going off to get married. They're, they're doing different things and so on. And um, so sometimes they cannot attend the module when it's on. Now, for the full time uh, students, the modules are on and there is they are expected to be available for those modules when they're on. Um, the part-time students, the first year, you should try and get as many of the modules done as you can in the first year. So the second year you can concentrate on the research side of it. But if you miss some of them because you're doing a part-time and you're in a job, uh, then there is an opportunity for you to pick them up in the second year. So if you're part-time, try and get most of the modules done this year, but make sure you liaise very carefully with EMER about that and booking it. Uh, so that um, you can be slotted in for the modules this year. And if you're not going to make it this year, you let us know so we can use that slot for somebody else. And then that we make sure we have you marked down to do the module next year. But for the, the full time students, the modules are on uh, when they're on. Um, but we do understand that you're all very busy and you're all doing different things and you're all working very hard and that these things happen. And we're we're very aware that as a group of students who are doing a master's, uh, you're, you're uh, very different to a lot of other students who are university based master's students in that there are huge uh, professional and training demands on you. And we understand that very clearly and I understand it very clearly and I expect and I'm, I'm very uh, approachable with regard to you letting me know that. And, and I do want you to let me know that even if you are uh, struggling with regard to getting through exams and modules and uh, coursework and and your actual job. So I understand it very well and, and we are very sympathetic to that. But having said all that, in order to maintain the integrity of the masters, which is your masters, because you'll be getting the qualification, we do have to have it at a certain standard, you know, so we do have to make sure that people attend the modules and make sure they do the work and pass the tests and submit the thesis at a reasonable standard. <clears throat> so we do have a level that we have to maintain, but we're very sympathetic and understanding for the, the, the challenges that you have. Uh, as part of your job. So um, the uh, thesis, um, ju just to talk about that for a little bit, um, that that is the bit that people kind of struggle with a little bit because the modules are all set and people turn up and there's assessments to go with the module and people do those assessments and they get through the modules and that the the thesis is uh, has a component of original research in it. Now the research idea 
ideally you can come along with it. And if you're doing urology or, or uh, ENT or cardiothoracic or orthopedics, whatever it is, you and you have an idea and you're working with somebody and they have an idea and you bring it along, then that you can make that your MCH thesis. Um, but a really important thing to say is that the emphasis is on research methodology. So sometimes people will come along with a clinical project that they've started where somebody they're working for has asked them to review 50 cases of, of a given procedure they've done. But the methodology is really all over the place. It's just not set up properly. And you know, students are very disappointed then when they've got involved in this research project and they've got ethics approval and then their methodology, uh, you know, t they're kind of told, well, it's not set up properly and it's not the methodology is not correct, so it needs to be redone. So if you have an idea, try and engage on the methodology side as quickly as possible with that rather than just racing off and doing loads of it. And the format of it is that when you do the module on research methodology, part of that module is you will present your proposal for your research project. And so some of the faculty and often myself included sit down and listen to these projects and we we critique it and we sort of say, yeah, well, that would be much better if you did this or don't forget to do that or you need to have a control group for that or, you, you know, we, we identify the potential methodology flaws in it and we point it out and we say, do that. And and sometimes we just say, look, that, that project's not really doable and it's uh, people are disappointed. You know, like somebody might want to look at the incidence of, of DVTs over uh, 10,000 uh, hip replacements um, and related to weather conditions or something. And, you know, the, the, those sort of projects, we, we will discourage people from doing it purely because of the logistics of getting it done in time. So the proposal section of the course, which is after the research methodology, is when you get the approval to go ahead and do the research project and the, the input into how you should do it and how you shouldn't do it. And it's really, really important that you do that because if you set that up properly, then when you go ahead and do the research project, you're up and running. And when you're doing the research project, up to this year, we have assigned a methodology supervisor to each student. Now, a few things have changed with regard to that. One is there aren't really enough. They're very hard to get methodology supervisors. Secondly, the, the students doing the masters didn't really engage with them that much uh, until the very end. And that was, and I know why that was, because you're all working really hard and suddenly you're doing loads of things and you've got loads of things you've got to prepare for and work on and do all the rest of it. And then it's a week or two before the submission deadline, you put together the thesis, you work all weekend on it, you work really hard on it, and then you hand it to the methodology supervisor the day before it's due to be submitted. And that causes problems, as you can imagine, because the methodology supervisor had regarded themselves as being available all the time and nobody was coming near them and then they get it at the very end. And I understand why that is because you're all working really hard and you're, you're kind of dealing with things as they, as they confront you to some extent. To some extent. So um, that, that system has changed now. Um, but what we will do is we will put a huge emphasis on the proposal, a huge emphasis on how your project is set up. And if you are told, look, that is not right the way you have that set up, and then you go on ahead and do the whole project the wrong way, then then you will be in a little bit of trouble, really, because if it's set up wrongly and you're told it's wrong, you go ahead and do it wrongly, then, you know, it's going to be hard to pass that. Um, but if it's set up properly and you go ahead and do it properly, uh, then you will pass. Um, and what we will do in, in that period is we are setting up a resource for you, for some of you, and it's mainly statistics people want help in or they want advice in. And that's what we're in the process of setting up something where we'll have a resource for you that you can access for in general statistical advice, but also methodological advice. But hopefully we will have set you on a fixed path early on in the process of your thesis that you know, anything you'll want is just a little tweaking and maybe some statistical advice. Um, and the, the other thing about that is that if you're doing a study, say, for example, where it's powered up and you need 90 patients and the six months goes by if you're full time or the year goes by if you're part time and you've got 22 patients uh, and you think I, I this is now I'm in trouble. You're not in trouble. If the methodology is correct, we don't really mind about that. In other words, we want it small but perfectly formed in a way like we want you to do it properly with regard to methodology uh, and we're not we realize that it's not powered up enough that you get it published in in a journal yet but you can go on and carry on adding in information to it after the thesis but so the methodology and how it's done is really what's so important and don't really get too focused on 
on results or outcomes or conclusions. Uh, although obviously if you can get that as well, it's it's so much the better. When I started this, I, I put in this rule the first year that you couldn't submit the thesis unless you submitted the written paper uh, ready for uh, submission to a journal. And the reason for that was to try and um, badger people or basically pressurize people into doing a paper for their own sakes, uh, not, not, not with any uh, representation from us, but so that they it would make you do the paper. But I, I stopped that for the reason that often the paper isn't powered up enough or the research is not powered up enough and, and it was an extra pressure and it, it just it didn't really work out. But we do want you presenting it. We do want you uh, producing this and publishing it. And a few years ago, we did compile uh, publications that came from the research and it really is a high yield of research, a uh, high yield of pub presentations and publications. And that's a reflection of the type of people that you all are really rather than than the MCH in particular and that you're all very driven and you're very focused and you're hard working and all the rest of it and we understand all that and when we see an MCH student who's kind of struggling we 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 know it's not because you're you're a group who's kind of dragging your feet we we understand all of those things so the thesis is the part that people get a little bit anxious about because uh, um, because it's a little less defined but I, I want to reassure you about that that there'll be those proposals, uh, submissions where you, we listen to them, we will define what you need to do, and then we will supervise that up to a point. And then there will be a resource whereby you can say, look, I'm not sure if I'm doing the right stats on this. Uh, I'm not sure if, I, if I'm doing this properly, or I need some maybe slightly sophisticated thing, or is it okay to do this? Or all these kind of questions that people have, and we will have something in, in place for that. Um, if you are struggling with it or if you aren't getting the patients or if you're just not getting the work done at least keep a communication with us you know and people don't want to do that again i understand that because it's kind of embarrassing to say hi uh, john o'burn here uh, i've done nothing since um since we last talked you know and and i, I understand that uh, but it, it silence is is uh, is worse actually than than nothing at all and if you don't get the thesis finished at all, the, the the basis of having it all um packaged into a 12 month period is particularly for those doing um, uh, full time who are planning to apply for the scheme next year or part time people who are doing it as interns are going into uh, first year of, uh, of CST is so that if it's in by next June, like the ones that are all being submitted now, they will be reviewed, they'll be sent to externs and the examiners meeting will be in September, October and hopefully they'll all be passed. Uh, and then they'd be conferred in November. So when they're applying next January, they're applying with their MCH and with all the points on their CV. So it's it's structured in that way. Um, if you miss the deadline, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter really because you can submit later. But if you're on that deadline of trying to get the points for next January, then if you don't get conferred, you don't get the points. Uh, having said that, if you're on CST already and you're, you're past, you're on year three or four and you're doing this as part of your uh, just general and you're not in that tight schedule, then it doesn't matter so much if you miss it, although if it drifts on and on and on, there's there's academic fees that go on with it. You know, not, not for the first three months uh, overrun, but but after that there is. Um, so are, are there any questions about that from anybody? Just while I confer with my notes and maybe Emer has still told me that I've, if there's anything I've left out. No, that's fine. Um, it's just on the year one students. I'll be sending you out a form for you to complete to let me know what modules you intend to complete this year. So I make sure that you are registered and ready to do that module this year. So as soon as you've had a look at the timetable, you can decide what modules which will suit you um, between now and December to complete. And I will make sure that you're on those for this year. Um, otherwise, uh, I would expect that you're taking it next year, but I, I, I'll send that to you anyway. Yeah, the other thing about the thesis is that we have um, some people who send in lists of topics of potential research uh, topics. So if you don't have anything um, and you uh, uh, would like to make contact with us about that, and they vary from things like there's an epidemiological one, there's uh, some to do with training, actually, some training uh, projects, research on training techniques and so on. And then there's other, uh, some basic science ones. 
Uh, the issue with, uh, and again, there's different appeals to different types. You know, this, uh, the commonest research thesis is uh, meta-analysis, where you, you take a series of, uh, of studies and you pool all the data and you do statistical analysis on that data and do a, a meta-analysis, a systematic review. Um, and they're popular because you can get the data at your own time. It doesn't require ethics approval. It is, it is a bit statistics heavy, but it, it tends to be a popular way of doing research. The, the issue of doing like a study of uh, prospective patients who present with such and such and how they get on or so on, these clinical studies require ethical approval. So they require a little bit of lead in time uh, and they can, they can sort of drag on a little bit and you might recruit the patients and so on. So they tend to be not so popular. And then there's basic science ones. But then if you're doing basic science um, studies, it takes a certain amount of time to get up to speed with the actual laboratory techniques. So, so they can be a little bit, um, uh, a, a little bit unpredictable as well. But overall, um, what what we generally tend to see is that people have their own idea. They've come along with a sort of an idea of somebody that they're working with. Now, sometimes we have to put a bullet in that, I'm afraid, because they're they're terrible ideas that'll never work and you'll never get approval for it. And, and they want to uh, radiate people and so on. Um, but usually they're good and we can we can really uh, um, tweak it and help you with that. And that's the ideal, really. And then you go ahead and you get a study and you present it at the meetings of the specialty that is relevant for you and you get it published in a place that's relevant to you. But if you're stuck, there is there is a few, uh, a little bit of a menu of, of kind of projects that we have and we can point you in the direction of, of those. So I think I have talked for way too long now looking at the schedule. Um, so I will um, now um, pass you on to Alan, who will talk about Moodle and give you instructions about um, all of that and what to do again. Um, this year, everything is all a bit a bit different with regard to things. The other thing that I, I say to the students every year is that if you see something or you think it could be better or something that's a problem with it or, uh, you know, if you have an idea, I, I we want you to do that. I mean, we normally get you to, to elect a class representative. Um, they've normally kind of declared themselves by now because they're normally at the front of the hand of asking all the questions and uh, on behalf of everybody. And they've normally self-selected, really. Uh, in this format, it, it, it doesn't lend itself to that so much. But if you do see something that you think could be done better, let us know because we're also feeling our way a little bit this year with regard to the online stuff. So Alan O'Gorman, um, thanks very much, Alan, for, for coming along and he'll, he'll just uh, chat to you about Moodle. Thanks, John. How you doing, everyone? Yeah. I hope you're, hope you're all well and uh, congratulations on securing your place on the program. Um, so my name is uh, Alan O'Gorman and I am the um, Moodle support specialist here in the IT department with the RCSI and I'm just here today to give you an overview of Moodle. Um, just, uh, I just want to give you a short demonstration on how to access it and what to expect when you log in. So let me just share my screen now. Okay. So Moodle is the, um, everyone can hear me, yeah, I take it. Yeah, we can hear you, Alan. That's fine. Yes, Okay. <laughs> so Moodle is the RCSI's virtual learning environment, um, otherwise known as the VLE. Um, it's where you're going to access all of your modules, your lectures, assignments, and various other course content. So to get to Moodle, to, to get to Moodle, you know, open up a browser on your machine, uh, preferably a Chrome browser. It's best viewed in, or any other um, up-to-date modern web browsers such as Microsoft Edge, Safari, or Firefox. So Sorry. you need to Sorry. enter the address. Uh, I can't see anything. Oh, can you not see me? It's just the problem, just me. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, Alan, I can see you. I can see my screen. Uh, I just say AO. Sorry. Yeah, I can see it actually. Okay, I'm not too sure what the problem is there. Everyone else can see my screen here now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to log out and log in back in. Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll continue on. So fire up a browser, as I said, pre preferably a Chrome one or any other modern up-to-date browser. Um, don't use Internet Explorer. It doesn't work. The whole thing will just fall apart and it'll look very messy. Um, so enter into the address bar, uh, the vle.rcsi.com, and you'll be taken to this page here. And when you receive your credentials, um, you will click on the RCSI staff and students uh, button here. 
and you'll be taken to a sign-in page. So enter in your um, RCSI email address, uh, like so, and then you'll click Next. And you'll be taken to another page here where you will input your password and then you'll click sign in. And then you can reduce the number of times that you're asked to sign in here and choose not to show the message again. So I'm going to select that and then I'll click yes. And then so you're taken immediately upon logging into a dashboard area here. And just below your name here, you'll see a course overview block. And this is where you'll see all of your course modules that you are in, in, enrolled in. Um, just up at the very top of the page here, you'll see the main navigational area. And when you click on the RCSI logo here, you'll be taken back to the dashboard area. Um, here across the top there, we have uh, some links to the student information, links to the library, support services, and various other services. And I'll let you explore these in your own time. Um, on the left, we have a um, navigational block here. That can be expanded and collapsed by clicking on the menu icon. And that gives the giving you more room in the center of your screen to uh, view the content. And um, there are quick links here back to your dashboard, the site home, and the calendar. Over on the right hand side, we have uh, the, the um, right navigational pane here as well. This is the, or the, or the right hand side block. And again, you'll see a calendar and um, a Microsoft block here where you'll have quick access to your email, your OneDrive and Microsoft Teams. Um, this can also be collapsed as well and expanded out. So by clicking this little red button here, um, again, to maximize the, the, the um, the content in the center of the screen. Um, OK, and then I'm just going to bring you into one of your modules. I'm not going to go in and, and explain everything um, about your modules unless uh, your coordinator do that for you. Um, so inside, this is one of your course pages, and um, you'll see various uh, types of content there that you'll be accessing throughout your course. I just want to give you just a quick example of um, um, a couple of items that we use here um, uh, on your course pages. One of them it would be, let's say, a forum. So you might see a forum post like this. Um, if you click into a discussion here that's started by myself, it's a little welcome message. You can, you can respond to forum posts here by just clicking the reply button and then typing in your message. And you can add attachments and then just click post to forum and you'll see then your your response here. So you've got up to about 30 minutes to delete that um, after, you, after you post. Um, if you're submitting an assignment, um, I can come back to the course page here by coming back through the breadcrumbs, and I, and I can click into this practice assignment. So you can practice this in your own time here. I will we'll leave this here on the course page. Um, so you'll see maybe an, an instruction for your assignment here. Uh, upload a Word document with 200 words. Um, so you just click on Add Submission. Um, you might have to select that this is all your own work. Just tick this little box here. And then you can drop in your file. So I'm just going to drop in a Word document here. Um, so I'll drop that in here. And then you will click Save Changes. So that's just a kind of a short example of how you will um, submit um, an assignment. Um, if you want to get back then to the dashboard, you can click this little link here um, or click the uh, RCSI logo up here. Uh, one more thing I want to show you that might be useful throughout your course is the under the support section here, um, IT support. Um, there, uh, there's some contact details you, could, you can reach us at. Um, should you have any problems with your Office 365 account or even logging into Moodle, you can phone the help desk at this number here. Or you can you can email the help desk at this address here, helpdesk at rcsi.ie. Um, we also have then maybe some sorry, just one more thing. So we have a software library here. Um, so depending on what device you have, either Mac or Windows, you can click click into it, and there will be some um, software like EndNote and Stata that you can download 
um, you will have to contact the IT help desk there to get that installed on your machine. Um, so, so that concludes the presentation. Um, just one more thing before I go. Um, can you see these slides here? Yep. Yeah. So if you have a, if you have any yeah. difficulties, yeah. So if you have any difficulties viewing your course pages, um, you can contact your program uh, coordinator, Emer Pike. There, that's her email address, emerpike at rcsi.ie. So if you're having any issues there, contact her uh, with regards uh, to viewing your course content. And uh, as I say, if you've got any any problems um, accessing your 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 um, your office account, you can contact the IT help desk. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Alan. Thanks for that. So, um, yeah, it's going to be really important, uh, obviously, uh, this year. And um, so just uh, moving on, Paul Murphy very kindly uh, has joined us to uh, instruct you all with regards to the library services. So thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, John, and hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Can you see my slide on the screen at the moment? Yes, that's fine, Paul. OK, good. Um, what I'll be doing is quickly outlining, sorry, it's moving on a bit faster. What I'll be doing is just giving you a brief overview of RCS Library, um, the main access portal to it, which is the library website, um, the tools we have that enable you to discover the books, journals and uh, other content that we have, and some word about library uh, services and support options that we offer. The library, um, it, the online resources are available 24 seven. OK, so again, coming through the front door, which is necessary to authenticate yourself, um, is uh, offering you the menu and the suite of services that we offer. But essentially, our electronic books and all of our electronic journals, as well as our databases, are available 24 seven. We also have an email and a chat support service for you um, via uh, an email link, which is staffed by us on uh, Monday to Friday, 10 to 5, and we will get back to you and respond to any queries that you have. And we've developed this quite a bit, obviously, in the context of the current services. So we are geared up to respond and to deal with one to one uh, issues uh, as they arise. The library's general collections in in addition to books, journals and databases, we are also the archive repository for all of the college's heritage material, books, manuscripts, instruments, all sorts of material from the inception of the college. So it forms a complete history really of surgery and medicine in Ireland. Our specialist services uh, are designed to enable you to find, manage and evaluate information uh, in as efficient and as uh, timely a way. And this comes into its own, obviously, when you get to the thesis stage in terms of developing a hypothesis, finding out what's uh, feasible uh, and what sort of evidence is out there. So we support you in terms of literature searching, in terms of the databases, and we're geared up to offer you one-to-one -one and group consultations um, by various different technologies. Uh, including this. So again, we're all pretty skilled in terms of supporting systematic reviews and evidence synthesis and more about that later. OK, so the main front door is the library website um, and that's the address. Uh, and it's important to come through the front door in terms of accessing the books and journals because there are authentication issues. Um, so from your point of view for the moment, your students, um, so the student services uh, begin with LibChat and the link to that, as well as the library catalogue, an A to Z of resources and the e-journal portal. They're the principal ones, uh, as well as uh, the Lib guides. Um, the physical library has been closed uh, since March um, and our services at York Street and at Bowman Hospital um, will be probably severely constrained for the foreseeable future. Um, but again, you can keep up to date with that in terms of we will be offering certain types of remote access and certain types of virtual services 
uh, to compensate for the closure of the physical spaces. The library catalog um, is your finding tool for all the books, and in particular, the electronic books. Again, they're available 24 seven, so they range from textbooks to obviously specialist resources um, such as databases and um, pharmacopoeia and other types of reference works. Um, so you can find um, virtually everything that we have in our collection uh, in terms of book material from the library catalogue and it's searchable um, by subject and by various different words or phrases. So for example, it contains um, the electronic verse versions of the uh, theses, uh, including MCHs uh, and other dissertations that have been completed by postgraduate students. Um, so all of those are available for, for quite a number of years and they're linked, they're discoverable in terms of the catalogue and then they are linked directly from the catalogue's um, entry. We also have an A to Z of all our resources, uh, all different um, types of packages, including journal packages, clinical summaries, reference works, databases and so on. And again, you can browse this and uh, <clears throat> refine your search results by the different types of resources. Um, again, it's accessed from the main library webpage under that particular URL. I'll say something about clinical summaries because um, we've always found that they, they've been very useful for uh, remote users. Some of you are probably more than familiar with some of these already. Up-to-date Dynamed, BMJ, best practice and learning. They give evidence-based summaries about healthcare topics and treatments. They are laid out in standard encyclopedic formats and they are both peer reviewed and synthesizing tools, regularly updated and linked outbound to di various different content. So for example, this is a screenshot from, from up to date and it contains again the standard summation of what is the subject, what might the uh, therapies or interventions uh, be, what might the diagnostics be. Um, all of this is peer reviewed um, and it is continuously updated. So in the case of damage control surgery, the literature, literature review content has been updated in July 2020. The um, sub summaries also contain very useful links to uh, clinical guidelines worldwide um, so that you can get a complete overview of the guidelines for a particular subject very rapidly. And they also contain references for the most up to date literature, including meta analysis and systematic reviews. So they are designed to be a one stop shop for quick lookup uh, and authoritative and um, peer reviewed evidence on a particular subject. So you can access the clinical summaries again from the library's front door via the A to Z resources. Just click on clinical summaries here uh, and it will open up uh, the links that will enable you to connect to them. We also have the journal indexes, OK, so everybody's familiar with Medline and Embase, the Corcoran Library and so on and so on. And again, these are all accessible from um, the A to Z. You simply type in the type of uh, resource you want or the name of the particular resource, in this case Medline. So we have a number of different versions of Medline, including the free PubMed, but also um, the subscribed versions for Ovid and EBSCOhost as well. So again, the A to Z is your jumping off point to connect to these uh, databases. Um, <clears throat> and again, when it comes to the, your thesis phase, uh, we'll be here to advise and help you navigate these, develop the kind of skills that might uh, aid you in uh, extracting uh, relevant literature, um, our studies of a particular type. Um, so for example, we have in the LibGuides, we have an extensive introduction to literature searching. This is how to do it. You don't need to know how to do it now, but at a future point in time, um, you can engage via the LibGuides the tutorials or the print guides um, that will help you get your head around the, some of the features of the many different uh, platforms that the uh, journal indexes are mounted on. 
Um, and remember, we can help you do this as well. We can advise and we can execute searches on your behalf should that be necessary. So we have again an, an extensive um, backup to you in terms of the databases, clinical summaries, journals, books, grey literature, preprints, systematic reviews, how to do them, rapid reviews, scoping reviews, evidence summaries and clinical guidelines. So you can get information about all of these types of uh, resources um, from the LibGuide section of the library website. Finding a particular journal and journal article, well, again, that's at the e-journal portal. Find the British Journal of Surgery. Uh, you'll be asked when you're off campus to enter your credentials. Now, that will be exactly the same as your Moodle uh, username and password, your general college username and password. It's necessary to enter them at this stage so that the publisher website knows that you are an RCSI user and that you're authenticated to read the full text of the journal or to access the resource without any further hindrance. So accessing the full, full text, you'll find that we have a little logo embedded in most of the databases um, that will uh, enable you uh, to connect through the RCSI portal to get to the full text of any article um, that's indexed. So LibGuides is um, the uh, resource that I would encourage you to browse when the time comes. Um, we've got various different guides on how to use various different applications, uh, information about uh, COVID, for example, and so on. And we're also on Moodle. So we have a very similar suite of uh, supports on Moodle. This is open access uh, for everybody. Um, so we've got various different guides on various different services and on various different applications. So you're welcome to use both LibGuides on the website and the library space on Moodle. You can contact us by email um, on both those addresses there. We're here to help you. As I say, um, we're geared up to provide one-to-one -one assistance um, for everybody, and um, I hope to, uh, that you will engage with us in the future. So thank you very much. And I will now pass you on to the next speaker, Claire Boyle. Uh, thanks very much for that, that Paul. And, and yeah, we just we just a uh, really fantastic uh, resource there. Really is uh, excellent. And so yeah, if if uh, if Claire, if it suits you, Claire, to talk. Yeah, I'm here. I just have a Hi, very Claire. quick presentation. Hi. Um, just around the fees office. Um. Okay, so hello everybody and welcome to RCSI. So I'm, my name's Claire. I am, I'm the fees manager in the RCSI and we look after the fees for all the college, so including your course. And um, so, just some, oh, uh, so our contact details. At the moment, we're currently working remotely, so uh, the best way to contact us is through student fees at rcsi.ie, and uh, we generally get back to emails within 24 hours uh, where possible. And um, so it's always to contact us if there is an issue with your fees or with anything, because then um, we can help if we know earlier. So um, always keep in touch if, the, if you find yourself in financial difficulty during the year. Uh, it's always handy that we know. It has to be loaded up, so it may be the next few days and I'll send it to you. Uh, so uh, payment due dates, these have been sent to you with your invoices. So uh, there's the full breakdown. So most people have paid by their uh, their first installment and their down payment. So the, the next balance will be due in around January. <clears throat> so we will send invoices uh, probably either late December or early January for the balance. And that will uh, show what's outstanding on your account. Again, if, if fees are going to be late or if there's delay, delays, uh, if you could just, just drop us an email and let us know, we can try and work with you to resolve any problems. Uh, so again, they have been forwarded to you, but if you need a confirmation, just let us know. Uh, our payment methods, so most people pay through international bank transfer. Um, so, or if you're local, it's it's through, the, um, through our BOI account, the, the details are there. We do have a credit card payment system, which is a third party um, called TransferMate. Um, 
they do charge about three percent of your paying by credit card so uh, unless you actually need to pay by a credit card our, our uh, advice would be to use the the bank to bank transfer and um, again full details are on the invoices and we always um include the bank details with for for payments and uh, the if you want receipts or to check on updates or online registration links or um, details on tax relief or just how to contact us, we do have a, a Moodle page and th that would be a good way to contact us. We will send details in the next couple of days of all the, the ways that it can be used and um, how to log in and where we are. Um, so that's the Moodle page. So this is the way that you request special receipts. If you want to invoice a statement or to change your home address, this is the way you do it. So you just log into the Moodle page and you go into forms and you select the one that you want. And again, we, we get back to students within 24 to 48 hours once we receive them. And um, we will, um, so these, our fees are uh, set up under the Irish Revenue System. So they are tax deductible, so you can claim tax credits. So what you'll need to do with that is to, to uh, request official receipts. So you can request them through this. So I'd advise everybody to do that. And um, that's really it. Uh, we're here to help. I suppose we're not in the college at the moment, but we are available to talk, to chat, or to get in contact at any time. So um, if anybody has any questions, just let me know. And if you ever need to contact us, again, best way to do it is, is through our email address. So that's all I have. Okay. Thanks, Claire. Hi. Yeah, thanks very much, Claire. Um, any questions on any? We, we can take take some questions. I mean, Claire, if there's any questions for Claire, you can you can ask now or, or get in touch subsequently. Um, we'll we'll move on to the next speaker, which is Professor Tom Fahey, who delivers the uh, research methodology. Is that Tom? Are you are you here? Maybe not. I am, John. I am. Sorry. Oh, Tom. Sorry. Yeah. Great stuff. So, thanks. Professor Fahey. <laughs> Uh, Professor Tom Fahey, Professor of General Practice in RCSI and classmate of mine from medical school and we've been friends for, for many, many years and uh, I have great, great uh, professional regard for him and great personal uh, fondness and so on. <laughs> the, uh, a fantastic uh, teacher and a fantastic researcher with an international reputation and also combined with a great um, ability to teach and a great interest in young doctors and that they do the research properly. Um, so I, uh, I'm i delighted that he, that he gives this module and I would urge on you as I did from the very start to um, uh, just follow the instructions that you're given, you know, just do the research project properly. You know, when you get the, pro when you present the proposal and it's, uh, it's presented to you and you've got a few critiques of it, just, just respond to those criticisms. They're, they're meant in a very good way, in a very positive way, and they're to get you to do a good project. And and uh, so the research methodology module is, is very much at the core of this whole MCH, because that's what we want you to be fundamentally is good doctors and part of being good doctors is being good researchers. And so that's why so I'll hand over to, to Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, John. Um, apologies for my uh, slightly informal appearance, but I'm on a week's uh, annual leave and I've been walking my dog so um, I, I've, I haven't got any slides today I just want to kind of re-emphasize some of the things that John has said first of all really to say that um, we're here to support you um, we think that this is an opportunity and as John says um, I think we both um, you know we're, we're qualified many years I only really became interested in research after I graduated as a doctor maybe three or four years after my initial vocational training in general practice and then I trained in epidemiology and public health in the UK. Um, and, uh, in, you know, it, it's not that long ago, but um, it was only when I was um, in in the UK and in Oxford where um, um, the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine was established that I, I found, you know, how research and evidence informs clinical practice. So, um, you know, our role is to facilitate and support you during the year of your MCH. Um, just a couple of things then. Um, the short course in research methods, um, that's the course that we run every twice a year. The dates this year, Ian will have them, are the 19th to the 23rd of October and then the 18th to the 22nd of January. And that's run by my younger colleagues in my department um, with a mixture of, of methodological and clinical backgrounds. 
So just to give you a, a rundown, I'll do a session on the fundamentals of research study design, along, along with my colleague Barbara Klein. Then Frank Doyle and Mary Clark, who are both health psychologists, do sessions on measuring health and health outcomes and quality of life measures, and then data management. Um, Frank Mariart uses uh, in the School of Pharmacy, then talks about writing a protocol for your research and the importance of what are known as standardised reporting guidelines. These are guidelines like the consort guideline, which you might be familiar with that accompanies the publication of a randomised trial, or the strobe guideline for observational research, their cohort case control or case series studies. Um, we then have a, sorry, I've just set off my iPhone. Um, we have a, two um, biostatistics sessions run by my colleague Fiona Boland and Pat Dicker, one on basic biostatistics and then one on further or slightly more advanced biostats. Um, Barbara Klein then comes back and does a session that supplements the session that Paul Murphy has just spoken to you uh, in relation to searching the biomedical literature and reference management. So we use EndNote reference management system and we use Stata um, as a statistical software package. And again, they, uh, uh, as, as you heard earlier, they'll be loaded on um, and you need to load them on and be, uh, see, uh, have them before you start the short course uh, this year. David Smith, uh, our Professor of Ethics, then does the Ethics Governance and Data Protection session. My colleague Susan Smith and colleague Gronia Cousins in the School of Pharmacy run a, a systematic review session on um, systematic reviews of randomised trials. And then last of all, I do a kind of a summing up session around essentially problem solving, give you a few questions and answer, answers and um, revise anything you want to discuss during the week. And um, as John has said, we run that, we've run that programme for about nearly 10 years, this programme for about 10 years. The MCH has included, uh, you, you'll have other doctors usually alongside you who are paying to do the course. Um, and it generally works reasonably well, I think. Um, after you've done the, pro the, the short course, then we do a day where you present a protocol to, to usually um, Professor Byrne or myself. And again, that's formative for you to improve, uh, understand the, the challenges, but also to present to each other and to critique each other's protocols. And that usually happens towards the end of the year and um, uh, finishes around. Uh, you'd be expected to submit that around the end of the year. Actually, you, we've, we've changed the submission date now to, to early January. Um, so that, that really kind of sums up what we're doing for you this year. Just to add in, in relation to uh, the supervi supervisory, supervisory arrangements this year, as John says, we're trying something slightly different this year. Um, I think we, we will probably be available. Um, I'll certainly be available to do a, uh, you know, a, a session in the new year in relation to anybody who wants to discuss their thesis. Um, Fiona Boland, as John has mentioned, and other biostatisticians will be also available to um, provide biostatistics advice. But very often, actually, I find it's it's around just more structural and methodological issues that you you need guidance, particularly in the first instance, because you know the commonest problem people tend to do is they tend to try and do too much in a thesis, and it, it's not necessary. It's a master's level thesis, and we're trying to get you to understand the methodological principles of study design and and um, analysis and interpretation. And uh, we're not looking for huge complexity. Uh, we're looking to support you, but we're also I hope you you do enough work to 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 gain an understanding of the importance of methods in, in research, so you can be a more uh, rounded doctor and using research to inform your clinical practice in the future. So um, thanks very much, and I'll hand you back to John. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Uh, so, you know, again, we keep saying the same thing, you know, the research methodology, the key part of it, we want you to do a thesis and we just want you to do it properly. Uh, you know, you're not, we're not, we're not expecting that you'll split the atom or find the cure for something incurable, um, but we want you just to learn how to do it properly. So the next, thanks very much, Tom. The next module is by Professor David Smith. Are you there, David? Hi, David. It's on healthcare ethics and the law. Um, it's been a very popular module, as I said early on, and uh, one that tends to work very well, students working in groups, and I guess we'll be just doing that online and doing presentations, which we assess. Um, is David, are you there? 
We can move on. Is Mary Collins, Dr. Mary Collins? No, uh, David, okay. Matthews will be next, John. Um, Mary's going to come in later. Great. OK, well, if I, I think uh, David Smith's um, not, not available at the moment. Um, so maybe uh, Dr. David Matthews, who delivers the module on medical devices, obviously a key one, as I said to you, and one that you can really enjoy. And, you know, the, the whole idea is that you, inv you invent something and then you get really, really rich and then you can just relax and um, take it easy. Um, so David is your passport to that. Am I right, David? Of course. I'll hand yeah. over to you. I just... So how are you doing? Um, my, my name is David Matthews. So I'm doing the the kind of a, the little left field module, um, but there's a kind of a reason we're doing it. And so my background is in uh, medical devices and medical device development. So what we're trying to really do is kind of bridge the gap between uh, you as a, as a clinician and the kind of medical device field. So to look at like the research is obviously a big part of what you do and where, where you can fit into kind of medical device development um, and how if you have an idea what you do with it and rather than coming to somebody saying I've got this idea and it's worth hundreds of millions um, how you can prepare yourself for that and unfortunately the reality is none of these ideas as ideas are worth hundreds of millions it takes a long long time so uh, it's to kind of go through that and kind of bridge that gap so I have a few slides here just to go through um, so why this is so important is that kind of most healthcare innovations originate from healthcare professionals and um, so be it problems or bottlenecks in the system that you may identify um, you know I'm sure every day you talk about problems or things that you don't like so if there's a, something that you don't like it could be, there could be a potential solution for it or it might be just an exist uh, improvements to existing devices which are something that are happening all the time or, or obviously a, a completely novel idea or a new way of doing something like um translational research where you have you see something maybe in cardiology and you think it might be suitable in neurology or whatever the case may be so the um I guess the question really is, if you have an idea, uh, what do you do with it? And this is kind of what we're going to explore and how how you can flesh this out a little bit. So um, if you have an idea, the first thing we need to do is, is figure out is there a clinical need? So is there an unmet need is, that, is the language we kind of use. Um, and what we really want to do, actually, which may go against what you, what you know, but fail fast and fail early. because So we don't really want to um spend a lot of money on something if there, there is no future in it okay so um if, if you're developing something you generally cast a wide net and, and you, you look at an awful lot of different things to try and figure out what you're you're coming up with and uh, the light bulb moment to be honest is not as i guess it's not as common as people think that you're just sitting at home one day and you have this light bulb moment where everything just perfectly this product just comes into your mind exactly how you do it or even at the theater and um, it, it's generally even the, the you know the most prominent people in the world and this one is called the foundry in in san francisco like it's a very it's it's, it's a very process oriented approach even the, the finding an idea so what we will cover in this is kind of if you have an idea we need to figure out as i said is there a clinical unmet need so we'd look at things like um, research the clinical area, look at current technologies, um, existing products that are there. And you'll generally identify shortcomings with them um, or, or what, can, what can be improved. Why do you think they're, they're, we need a new product? Like the Foley catheter, people have talked about that being great and they also have talked about, you know, the shortcomings with it, but it's still probably one of the most popular ones. So then you would like identify the, the key markets, the key market trends. So is this something that's kind of, um, is it an area where it, it's growing or is it, or is it falling, right? Um, who are the key competitors? What kind of um, market share did it have? How would you get into the market? So routes to market, various different things like that. So if we get kind of key indicators here, then are very promising, then we'll, we'll continue. So. This is all research, and, and the reason this is so important is because 
I have had um, in the past consultants come to me with an idea on a piece of paper and one A4 piece of paper and it's a diagram and they tell me that this is a revolutionary idea and after a 10 minute search on the internet I find multiple products that are the same and then they said oh well we don't have that in the matter and I said yeah but it doesn't mean it's not available so th these kind of things need to be just because we don't we don't use something here doesn't mean it's not available um so i guess um uh, to do that then after that we're going to kind of if we think there's there's promise in it we'll do brainstorming and kind of con generate concepts um and and this where this is where you need to be kind of talking with people there is a a preconception you don't talk to anybody you know i've got this idea someone will steal it on me and i guess what i'll say about that is especially in medical in the medical field if they do steal your idea maybe fair play to them because would, would you ever have done anything with it yourself uh, and if you're not going to do anything with it then, then someone might as well but the reality is if you're going to develop a medical device it takes years and massive dedication. So it, it's not something that somebody's going to do lightly. So you do need to figure out if your idea um, suits the market, suits, like you need to talk to your colleagues, key opinion leaders, to see if it's something that they see as a problem as well, and is the direction that you're taking with your idea, your device, be it a medical device or a surgical instrument or whatever it is, um, it is, is the right way that the market perceives it. And then we'll talk a little bit about patents. One, one of the, the, the things we hear a lot about is that if you have an idea, you need to patent it. I do a lot of work with patents now. And to be honest, that's, again, you just need to be careful about that because a patent um, can cost a huge amount of money. It has a subscription-based model, so you would pay for it every couple of years. And most patents are not worth the paper they're printed on. Um, so. You kind of only really want to have patent and you've kind of got an idea of what you're looking to do so we kind of talk about that and we put this into then how we deliver it so this is the most i think it, it's a very interactive module and it was designed because in this way because i guess i know it's not your your um your bread and butter so i'm trying to make it as interesting as possible so it, it covers a different a lot of different areas and um, we have lectures and they're not too heavy they're uh, example focused really rather than theory and um, we've got a workshop on app and app development uh, some people a lot one of the things they always talk about is i've got an idea for an app and um, so we just talk about how you go about doing that and i guess the reality within that just one simple um point on apps is like an iphone user is is likely to pay for an app whereas an android user is not you know much more likely so um so when you're 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 developing an app for different areas why are there are differences and different things like that and um, so a lot of it then will be focused on a, a, an idea let's say that and we'll do brainstorming sessions on that so that's i think at the moment that's going ahead as, as a, a physical um brainstorming session where i would put you into groups and um, you'll have an idea to and um you look at going about generating ideas and I don't know whether how many people know one another, but that's something you could be thinking about now. The project is always the same. Um, identify a problem, or you know, be it in uh, your work environment or something that you're interested in in the developing world or whatever, um, and see see can you can you um, you know build on that. Um, so to do that again, um, another thing that came up when I started this uh, module was that. Yeah, you're an engineer. My background's engineering. Um, so you're an engineer. That's fine. But I'm a doctor. So I have got a couple of speakers in. I generally get two speakers in um, who are doctors or clinicians or consultants at one point and have left or are maybe either full time or part time in, in the medical device field. And they will talk about their journey and their learnings and why they did it and um, the different mechanisms and how you can go about it. Uh, the assessment then will be a group assessment. Um, so again, the development of a medical device is very, very much a kind of a group process. So we'll put you into groups of four or five. As I said, you identify a problem. And I kind of cover it in the same rationale as if you were applying for a grant or if you're looking for the first 100,000 to prove your concept. Um, because it's it's actually not that different 
um, other than the finances and the, and the detail you'll need to go into on if you're looking to raise a million or two million further down the line. So it's really just that that you can, if you had an idea and, and you wanted to be able to kind of um, prepare all this, that you, you know what to do. Um, so another question I get asked then is, well, I'm a consultant, where, where do I fit into this process? Um, well, I guess there are a number of areas that you could fit into. So like there, the guys that I will bring in or girls are, are generally co-founders. Um, in one or two cases, there might be a chief medical officer. Um, in one case, I had um, someone who was part -time, part time chief medical officer. They were a co-founder and they had gone back to medicine and they were kind of a they're working down as, as the clinical advisor on the development of, of the device. So there are a number of different areas. This is probably the clinical investigator is probably the area that most of you will be most likely to, to maybe go into further down the line. And again, we kind of talk about those kind of things and the, the people that we have will kind of give you examples of that as to how, how that operates. Um, so finally then the learning outcomes, what do I want you to get out of this? The reality is I know you're not going to use it on a day to day basis. Um, it's probably something that you're not thinking about today or tomorrow, but there are. I, I, I will also introduce a, a course to you called BioInnovate, which is a is a, a group that they team up with an engineer, a business person, and um, a doctor or a medic, and they work in they work in trying to find a new idea and and kind of develop it then along. And in a lot of cases, then they might form a company together or you know that that kind of thing. But from this short module, what we want to get out of it is kind of, I want to give you like a toolkit of skills to maybe identify problems and unmet needs, recognize what, what is an unmet need, um, conduct the background research, kind of complete a business analysis to figure out yourself where it's a viable product. Um, and then conduct brainstorming sessions, evaluate concepts, and understand then the key concepts, key areas like your clinical trials, health economics. So one of the most important things nowadays is health economics. So if you're developing a device or a new solution, it needs to be at least as good as, if not a lot better than existing devices on the market. Um, and it will probably need to be cheaper as well, because if you're giving significantly better results um, and it's the same price. So you, you might have a chance of getting it reimbursed or, or, or entered into, the, into the, the health service. But if it's if it's above the cost, you know, there, there needs to be a reason for them to take the risk on you to, to do that, to do that. Um, again, the intellectual property. So one of the other things on that one is just a, another point on that is that it's um, you have to remember in a lot of these areas that if you like if you're if you ask somebody to conduct a business analysis or someone to do your intellectual property, if you have somebody writing your patent, okay, and you go to, to somebody and say, I've got this idea, and this guy's gonna charge you, he's gonna give you one hour meeting, okay? And after that, then every hour he's gonna charge you. He's gonna tell you it's a great idea. He's going to tell you that he can get you a patent on this, right? Absolutely. And I'm here to tell you now that that's fine, but you need to know, you need to be a little bit savvy on that because he'll always take your money. So you need to kind of understand a little bit about that so that you don't end up paying five or 10,000 on a patent that has no value. So it's just about learning a few bits and pieces so that you're a little bit clever if something happens in the future. Um, so it, it's really about how you, how can you pro, uh, progress your idea um, as much as you can and then who do you go to to try and help you to get there further, or do you partner with engineers, or do you partner with someone that you can't do it alone? As I said, it's a team process. So that's kind of what I want to get. I just want to kind of leave it as a toolkit in the back of your mind that if you have an idea in five years' time, you go, oh yeah. Before I talk to anybody, I need to, you know, do a bit of background research. I need to look at the trends in the market. I need to see, you know, are there any other products out there that are similar to mine? So you do all that kind of front loaded research and then you can progress and talk to the correct people. So that's really what I'll cover with you and we'll cover it in uh, the example that I will give is kind of, as I said, if you're looking for the first 100,000 and what you'll find is that w whether you're looking for 100,000 off Enterprise Ireland or off Mayo Clinic, the process is the same. So, so that's really what I'll cover and, and I look forward to seeing you then. If there's one thing I'll just leave you with, you, if you want to 
think about your groups because you're going to be put in groups of four or five. And that the project will be identify a problem and develop it. Thank you, John. Okay. OK, thanks, David. Fantastic. Um, so are there any questions about any of that from to any of the previous speakers? Because we're sort of in a situation uh, we're, we're kind of we're waiting for David Smith and uh, Mary Collins uh, to, to join us. Are there, does anybody have any questions? Uh, John, it's Sam McConkie here. I'm happy to do my bit on global oh, surgery great. now. If yeah. you'd like me to go early, if you're waiting for yeah. someone. That would, no, that would be great, Sam. So I'll introduce you. I think uh, everybody knows who you are, Sam, and thanks for all your, your work that you're doing in regard to public health. Um, but Sam has been uh, running the uh, surgery in the developing world module uh, for since we started the, the MCH. and. Um, uh, in fact, has a lot of experience of working overseas, which he shares with us. And he also identifies speakers who have uh, very good experience in these different areas. In fact, you know, a few years ago, we had the uh, MCH reviewed externally and, um, you know, all the modules were examined and looked at for different specific learning goals and learning outcomes. And, and this module um, is, is such an educational module that it, it, although it doesn't lend itself specifically to exact you will learn this, this and this, but in fact it was one of the modules that, that it was quite clear that it was a particularly popular module amongst the students and the external reviewers recognised this and were, were very sort of complimentary of it as being something that's a very, very uh, useful uh, part of this programme. So I'm very grateful to Sam for, for developing it and delivering it all, all, all over the years, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So thanks very much for, for joining us today, Sam. I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, John. Uh, my, when I uh, put my uh, Zoom meeting or Microsoft Teams meeting onto video, the quality of my sound deteriorates. So if everyone's OK, I'm going to not put my picture up uh, on your screens, if that's OK. We can watch you, John, instead. You're probably more pretty and more appropriately dressed than I am. So is everyone hearing me? Could I just do a sound check before I start to talk? All yes. good, Sam. Yeah, hearing you right here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Or you can, OK, thank you. So my own personal background is doing uh, tropical medicine in a mission hospital in Sierra Leone and then subsequently in Gambia, also in Kenya, uh, Uganda and Vietnam. And there, when you're working in those settings, you, you don't just become a pediatrician or a physician, you, you, you do obstetrics and surgery. And I, I did a lot of uh, surgery. I enjoyed it and I had some very good surgical training uh, from a gynecologist uh, who was a, some gynecologists are the most expert operators, as I'm sure you all know. So my basic uh, surgery, I, I learned from obstetrician and gynecologist. I then uh, decided there was very little literature about surgery in Africa and wrote up the case series of uh, acute abdomens that I operated on, which was probably only about a quarter of my total workload, or maybe even 20% was acute abdomens. But I wrote that and published a case series of 184 acute abdomens back in 1995 or six in the World Journal of Surgery, when nobody published on this before. And at that stage, it was the largest series of acute abdomens uh, in the world for, for or, or, or sorry, in, from Africa uh, for a long period of time. Now, I realized that over the last uh, 10 years since we've uh, created this module, our CSI's COSEXA program and Cost Africa program have, have grown and matured. We now have a professor of global surgery, Mark Chan, who I welcome here very, very much. And this module may well hand over to his department. Uh, we've been talking in general terms with this. I'm not sure if Mark is on this call or not, but uh, this, this module may transfer from the Department of international health and tropical medicine in, into the global surgery department because that's maybe where it sits best. And I, I certainly won't feel bad about that. It's a bit like having a child as a parent and eventually you hope they get to 18 or 20 and they develop little butterfly wings and fly off and, and live somewhere else if you're lucky. And if they don't, if they're still living with you by 40, then there's clearly a problem of one sort or another. So I, I don't feel bad with that. So let me talk about like this module. Uh, it's designed to challenge you 
are with diversity, uh, geographical diversity. So looking at the challenges of working in uh, different parts of the world where there's radically different access to healthcare and electricity and clean water. It's designed to challenge you for working in different cultural settings where people's expectations of what they want may be uh, different from your own or what your other patients. So how you can maybe negotiate that. Thirdly, it's a uh, diversity of uh, different uh, ways of doing surgery. So many of you will be here in a very high tech environment, but yet in a developing country situation, sometimes the easiest, quickest, safest, uh, wisest thing to do is a low technology uh, simple old uh, traditional approach to things. How do we teach it? Uh, we have, uh, I would say, a diversity of different types of people who come in to teach it. Some from UK and some from Ireland, many from outside of RCSI. In some cases, it's to give you management type uh, stories to help you to cope with new situations through having heard other people's experiences. It, it shares with you models of how to work in other countries. Um, we have someone like Martin Corbley, who's uh, flying in to, to do Operation Smile, built on many years of building this long-term relationship. Uh, we also then have uh, COSEXA, which as I mentioned earlier, is based on a, a multi-year, hopefully multi-decade, collaboration between RCSI in Dublin and the College of Surgeons in Eastern Central Africa uh, with long term commitment and mutual learning from both sides. So we, we will share with you different models of, of doing this, including uh, MSF, um, who do a lot of kind of crisis emergency uh, surgery and obstetrics and also some more development oriented workers. The second tack of this is looking at some challenging cases. So you're all used to cases in Ireland or, or Europe or maybe America, but we will share with you cases that are much more common perhaps in developing countries and are maybe more unique in Africa. I'm not going to tell you what those are because we're going to put you in small groups of um, about two or three to work through these case based challenges. So we're going to be putting you in teams of two and three to um, ask yourselves questions and do a literature review on what could be causing the clinical scenario that we described to you, and then how would you manage it? And this is a we're we're inviting you to come up with practical, tangible ways to manage clinical cases, a bit like sort of a third year medical student would approach someone with chest pain or or shortness of breath. We we want. Uh, thinking about investigations, thinking about clinical tests, and then things you would do. And in surgery, often one of the most important decisions is to operate or not. So th this this is a critical decision point that a surgeon has to make, which is quite difficult uh, and and challenging. And and we're we're really asking you to tell us in those clinical scenarios: Would you operate? And when and how, almost about incisions and what you what you might expect when you get in there. You will present those cases then to us in a, a Zoom uh, type session to myself and two of the other faculty members and to all of your peers. And part of the assessment is the quality of presentations there. Not everyone in the team has to present. How you do it is up to you, and it's it's a team mark for the two or three people that are on the on the team. The, the, the second team based work is in groups of uh, uh, probably about eight, eight different groups of four or five in each group. And there we're looking at management challenges. Uh, one, for example, is what can you do with no blood transfusion? Another is about infection control. So it's looking at more the surgeon as a clinical leader and the surgeon as a manager and a leader of a team, often in a, a crisis type situation that is more about the system you're in rather than about the actual individual patient care. And again, each of you will have an opportunity to work with four or five others and to address some of those challenges. What we're looking for there is a literature review. So get onto PubMed, get onto the surgical literature, even case studies of examples of good practice from other countries is sometimes the best you can get. But there we're looking for uh, uh, the people who hit the scientific literature to try and answer the questions best is, is what we feel is, is excellence 
is uh, reviewing the what's been published and described by others that applies appropriately to, to the, the challenge, the management challenge that, that you've got. Uh, the, the assessment uh, on that, that also gets a mark, a team mark for the four people. And that course are the two that I've just described. One is your team-based contribution to clinical cases. And secondly, is your team-based contribution to uh, the, the, the management challenge. So that's really all I have to say at this point. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, Sam. Um, that was a uh, yeah, really good uh, summary of it. It's it's a, a really popular module. Um, as I say, it does it does touch on all of these things, and it you know it does <clears throat> it does tell you the different opportunities that you can have um, to to go and do this sort of work uh, around the world. Um, and you're meeting people who've actually done it and they, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously they're not looking at this through rose tinted glasses at all. And, you know, they'll, they describe the, the, the challenges uh, very, very clearly and, and what you can expect and not expect. Uh, and it's, it's really good. It's a really good module. And uh, as I say, thanks very much, Sam, for, for delivering this. And thanks for talking this evening. Um, I see Dr. Mary Collins is here. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so Mary is uh, delivering the leadership and management module and uh, uh, thanks very much for coming along to to talk to this year's incoming students. Thank you, Mary. Great. Many thanks, John. And good afternoon to everyone. It's really lovely to meet you all virtually. Um, John, I have to say you made me very nostalgic uh, talking about Stevens Green on a sunny afternoon. And um, I think we're all uh, we are all missing uh, the face-to-face -face interactions and contact. Um, and that really is one, uh, it's a key leadership challenge at the moment. We're talking about leadership. So I, I'm the uh, module lead for leading and managing your organization. Um, and this is, as John mentioned at the start, something that in, in terms of your future careers um, is really key. And now more than ever, leadership is such a critical skill in healthcare. I think we've seen some fantastic examples of great leadership during this global pandemic. And if I may, uh, I don't know if Sam is still with us, but I think Sam certainly is exemplifying, you know, excellent leadership skills along with other colleagues in the Royal College of Surgeons. And indeed, um, I think how we've responded as a country, we've seen really strong leadership. And we've also seen examples of very poor leadership internationally. So um, I'm just going to share some slides with you now um, to give you a sense of what we're going to be covering in this module. OK, so can everybody see those? Emer, can you see the slides? Yes, Mary, yeah, very good. Brilliant, brilliant, thank you. Um, so what is clinical leadership? Well, um, leadership is a skill set around influencing, setting direction, making solid, clear decisions. And it is becoming more and more important in healthcare. So my role is program director with the RCSI Institute of Leadership. Um, we're based in Sandyford usually, <laughs> but we're all based at home at the moment. And the Institute of Leadership was set up uh, 15 years ago now to support health professionals in developing their management and leadership capability. So we run programmes across three sites, Bahrain, Dubai, and of course in Ireland. And we have um, professional diplomas, executive development, and MSc programmes. And we're delighted to, to work um, on this MCH with you all and with the team, and we've been doing so for a number of years now. But the concept of healthcare professionals as opposed to professional managers undertaking the leadership task. So what is that? That is setting, inspiring, and promoting values and vision using their clinical experience and skills to ensure that the needs of the patient are the central focus in their organization's aims and delivery. The content is grounded in the NHS clinical leadership model. 
This is an evidence-based approach to developing leadership competencies, and we'll work through them. You will notice that the, at the, the first um, concept here is all around developing personal qualities. And our philosophy in the Institute of Leadership is all leadership starts with self-leadership. You need to manage yourself. You need to keep yourself motivated. You need to manage your own emotions well in order to influence and engage well with others. We then look at working, how we collaborate with, te with team members, how we manage performance effectively, how to deal with conflict in the workplace, um, and moving on then, looking at the whole area of financial management, developing strategy, and an important piece more than ever this year is the whole area of resilience. And how do you keep emotionally resilient in these most difficult times? So our module objectives are quite broad. And uh, we're gonna look at different leadership approaches, different leadership frameworks. We're going to examine strategic tools and I, I should say that this is very much applying the theory to practice. So we will be asking you within your hospitals to actually find out what is the hospital strategy, if one exists, <laughs> and then to critique it, looking at the, the current literature best practice in developing a strategy. So it, it's very much based around um, the context you're working in or will be working in. We look at the importance of organizational culture. We look at financial management. Um, again, very important, um, as John said, not that you may be actually um, working on accounts, but you need to speak the language. You need to understand the language um, of budgeting and financial management. We look at performance management. And then the module really um, culminates in a case study. So that is the the biggest part of the assignments, which I'll go to shortly. So in terms of our timetable, sadly, we will not meet in person given the current constraints um, and consequences, but we will um, have two synchronistic days. And by that, I mean, we will be live, two half days where we will be live. So I would really encourage each of you now to put these dates in the diary and really have them in stone. It's very important that, um, that we do connect in, in this way. So November 12th and December 3rd. And um, I know Emer will have shared those dates with you. The other content is going to be blended and it's going to be um, on-demand content on our virtual learning site. And we will be um, ensuring that you do get to complete that. We'll be sending you prompts and we want it to be as engaging and interactive as possible. So. There'll be discussion forums, there'll be polls, there'll be quizzes, et cetera. So really do stay close to the Moodle site um, where we will guide and direct you to all the materials that we have. And finally then, um, this module has three assignment elements. The first is a finance presentation. The second is a strategy presentation, both worth 20% and the Harvard Business Review written case analysis is, which is due at the end of January next year, is worth 60%. Um, please don't worry at this stage, you will get a lot of support around how to actually go about um, preparing these presentations and lots of support material online. So uh, I'm very much uh, looking forward to working with you as part of this um, module and happy to take any questions if anyone has any now. Sorry, Mary, one student has a question. Um, they actually completed a course recently in leadership. Now I've asked them to send me the details, but would that exempt them from part of, the, of this course or do they need to attend this course in full for the MCH? Um, I'd need to see the content, Emer. Um, leadership sorry, is, sorry, yes. Can I just ask the question? So I did the RCSI accredited medical leadership course. It's run by RCSI, three day course. And I just did it, uh, finished around, I think in May, just before COVID and did the third part online. So I do have a certificate from RCSI. 
Is that the same thing or do we get an exemption for that or not? Um, I'd need to have a look at the content. I, I don't believe you will have covered most of what we cover. This is quite a specific module on leading and managing your organization. But let me have a look at it. If you can please just uh, drop me a note separately, I'll, I'll take a look at that yeah. for you. Is that okay? Okay, no problem. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mary. And uh, th thanks for the, the question. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely get that sorted out. Yeah. Um, David Smith is the last speaker. I don't know if David is, is here or has, has got to join us yet. Um, I've had so, no word from him now. He was due to come in, but I don't see him there yet. Is he, um, what, what, I'm just looking at the timetable. Would he be expecting? Uh, no, yeah. we're past his time now at this stage. Okay, well, look, we we can um, we can we can send you the information about that. You know, we do we do have a summary. I think you know we we've we've had a decent session here. I think you know you you I think have all uh, probably had a very good insight into um, this course, and I'm sure you've spoken to your uh, colleagues and your predecessors about it. And I, I think you can see from each of the people who've delivered the module, and David Smith's module is the same. I, I can assure you, there's a, there's a huge commitment from him, and uh, you know that, that he, he can't make today, so there must be a pretty good reason for that. Um, I, I think you can see that all the module leaders uh, take these really seriously, and you know are very uh, pleased and rightly proud of of the module content, and it's very much focused towards you and what you need, and you as as trainees, and you as uh, as doctors and as surgeons and uh, consultants of the future. So um, yeah, I, I think you probably can pick up, you know, the effort and preparation and commitment that there is from the people delivering the modules and from Emer and and in fact from myself. Um, uh, and the part of it, as I said, that's not really described to you in detail is the research project that you you yourself will be doing. Although we've emphasised it over and over again, the importance of you preparing it properly and getting the methodology properly and then doing it properly. Um, so I. Are there any questions that any of you have? I mean, this chat thing is, is pretty handy because, you know, people don't have to put their hands up, but, you know, you, you can, if, if you do have any questions that you want to ask now, please, please feel comfortable about asking them with regard to any aspect of the Masters, either for myself or any of the module leads. I can, can I just ask three. for the... Yeah. Sorry, yes? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Leah here um, oh, I'm just wondering right. for, I'm doing the part-time two-year course and for the thesis part is the proposal for that is that I think we do our research part in January is the proposal due kind of March April if you're doing the two-year course or is that due next year how does that work uh, the the it is um, structured loosely let's say in such a way that ideally you do the modules in year one and you do the research in year two um the so ideally your proposal will have been assessed in year one uh when you yes as part and not not at the same time as the short course but as part of that process in a way um so ideally you'll have had the proposal and the approval before you go on to year two and you're right every so often there are problems because people get started on a project in year one before they've actually completed the proposal submission and that and we work around that a little bit but ideally the structure of it is that you do the short course then you uh, you then design your research project then you present it at the day when all the uh, project proposals are, are assessed and then it's either approved or critiqued or tweaked or or whatever. And then you just go on during year two part time doing the research project. But often it happens that, uh, you know, as, as Emer has alluded to earlier, that you have uh, aren't able to get sufficient leave to do all of your modules in year one. So some of the modules um, you have to pick up in year two. But from a research point of view, we ideally like you to do research methodology year one proposal year one research thesis in year two. Is it is that your was that your question? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. But sorry, it doesn't always. Just... Yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, sorry, Emer. Sorry, John, just to clarify that now, um, Alva, you will do the course in the January of 2021. However, your presentation of your proposal won't take place until the beginning of the next academic year. So in other words, 
you will put in your proposal for the November of 2021. It won't be in, in November 2020. So therefore you're getting a fresh, somebody is looking at your ideas fresh so that you're going straight into doing the year then of writing up your dissertation. It, year ones will not be looked at until the following year two academic year. We only look, so therefore the ones that are doing the course in November or October this year, they will be the year twos who didn't pick up the course last year or the full time. And they are the only ones that will present their protocols this year. So they will be presenting okay. their protocol in December 20 and then their submission will be in, in January 21 and then year ones will do the same the following year. Thanks, Mark. I hope that doesn't confuse you now. <laughs> Um, there's one other thing, actually, the uh, all the correspondence, may, maybe you said this email, but it's just one of the notes that's jotted down here, yeah, is through an RCSI yeah. email. Yeah, you said that already. Yeah. OK, so don't be using your own email or expect it to go to Gmail or whatever. Uh, it's all, all through the RCSI email. Um, any more questions? So, um, like obviously you realize Emer Pike has gone to you go, work so hard at this, getting the whole administration of us, getting us all together, getting us uh, all lined up and and getting you all fixed up with your modules. And I said, as we said before, you keep in touch with us about different things. You know, if you're having difficulties getting to a module, let us know as early as possible. If you're having difficulty getting time off, we understand that. Just let us know about that too. If you're having difficulties with your thesis, with your project, with your proposal, just let us know about that. And then when once it gets to that stage that you're put on a certain direction to to do your project, we do kind of leave you alone, uh, but we do want you to, to feed back on us. And it's always that balance of, of kind of pestering you and leaving you alone um, that, that we we try and steer a path through that. Um, you know, there there are some people who don't complete this this masters uh, because of the nature of the work that you're doing. I think it becomes very demanding. And then, uh, but but you know, we really try and do everything that we can to get people through. And they don't all do it in a year or two years or three years. In fact, uh, my SBO that I'm working with here today, we were just talking about it. it. Took him a little more than two years, but you know, he, he got through it and he's 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 pleased with it. And I think you've seen from the modules, they're very useful to you. They're also useful to you, and we've had this feedback that for interviews, in fact, because a lot of the interview questions tend to uh, deal with topics that tend to be covered in these modules, particularly like the leadership management and conflict and and, and different aspects of that. Um, not that we've designed it uh, to tailor it to interviews, but it is one of those things. So I think overall, you know, students tend to really enjoy this master's. We we go to a lot of trouble, as I think you can see. Emer goes to a huge amount of trouble. The module directors go to a lot of trouble, have a lot of interest, really want you to have a good time. And we, we really want you to enjoy it. And we want you to meet the standards, get through it, get out the far end with your master's and then, then you know, use the skills that you've got and, and use the qualification for your career progression and hopefully publish the or present at least the, the research that you've done. So I thank you all very much for uh, joining us. Uh, again, it would it is really nice when we all meet up and, and maybe maybe we will. Um, and uh, but we'll keep in touch anyway, virtually. And I wish you all the best with your jobs and your careers and doing this masters. And thanks for joining us. And thanks again to all the module um, leads for modules that they give and for coming along this evening and contributing and and, and uh, explaining everything to to you all. So Sorry, John, we'll leave it at that. Go, yeah. um, it's just a few meeting that just chats coming in that I just want to bring to your attention. And um, Agri has asked the question. He's working on research at the moment and he's wondering if he can use the same research for his MCH. Uh, well, you'll need to send in the uh, proposal. If it's nearly completed research, then no is the answer to that. Uh, if it is, um, uh, you know, if it's all been done and that, and the if it if it's not done really meeting the appropriate methodology, then no is also the answer to that. Um, if if it's the beginning of an idea and there's been some pilot work that's been done on an idea and now he wants to fully flesh it out and put an ethical whatever it is and now having done some preliminary work on a research topic he has identified a further research question and it is clear that the methodology is appropriate and it's done properly then yes is probably the answer 
Um, but yeah, you know, we, we have this regularly enough that people come along halfway through a project uh, or with a project that's completed. And we, we tend to want, well, we do want people to take a project uh, quite early on, establish a methodology, be quite clear that it's done properly, and then do that research. So we, we don't take uh, a research project that's completed and bundle it up and package it and put it in as a thesis. Well, that's, that's not really what we want. Um, but if it is uh, work that you've just got a little bit, if you feel you've done a little bit of preliminary study on 10 patients and you can see a, a, a definite research question that requires uh, answering, and it is a new extension of work that you've done, uh, and we can make sure that it's done, the methodology is appropriate, and then off you go for sure. Thanks, John. Yeah, sure. Okay. So we're we're available all the time. So we'll we'll uh, leave it at that. And unless there's any other questions. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you all.